Hi, everyone. Today we're going to talk about principal component analysis, or PCA. And a whole bunch of the rest of the course is going to be based on this. So I'd say about five lectures worth of the rest of the course are building on what we're doing today. So it's relatively important. OK. So last time on Friday, we talked about maximum likelihood estimation and map estimation. And we had this idea that Bayes' theorem tells us how to combine the data piece and the prior piece. And it tells us actually just multiply them. That's, and, and so that's what we did. Um, and if we take the log, then that multiplication becomes addition. So we're actually summing the term that comes from the data and the term that comes from the prior. And we found that that's an equivalent view of our loss function and our regularization. So we had this equivalence between the likelihood function and the loss, and then the prior and the regularization. So last time we concluded part three of the course, uh, which was this uh, linear models for supervised learning. So we did this for a long time, maybe three weeks or so, um, of all these different linear models. We talked about change of basis. We talked about least squares, regularization, different losses, and this MLE map stuff. We also talked about gradient descent and stochastic gradient, and kernels, and feature selection. So this part three was a pretty hefty part of the course. And it, taking an even more zoomed out view of where we are in the course, we kind of started with supervised learning based on, well, counting and distances, meaning like naive Bayes and KNN and that kind of stuff. Then we switched into unsupervised learning. And we talked about clustering. Then we switched back to supervised learning, but in particular linear models. And starting today, we're going back to unsupervised learning again. But we're sticking for the moment with this idea of linear models. So we're building on our things we've learned previously in the course, but we're going back to unsupervised learning. I think we're, we're only going to switch one more time. So there's basically part five, and then we're done. OK, so we can name part four of the course latent factor models. And we can think of it as learning a basis or learning a transformation. So whenever we use the letter Z in the course, we've been using it to mean our transformed feature. So we made poly polynomials. We called it Z. RBFs, we called it Z. Um, we talked about kernels as, as another way of dealing with this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try to learn that new basis or new representation automatically from the data. And I've sort of um, gotten into this habit now, sort of by accident, but I end up really liking it that uh, I do these two lecture sequences on topics where the first time we just talk about the model, and then the second class we talk about the loss function and optimization. So I'm going to be following that pattern again. Uh, I guess we kind of did that for linear regression, then linear classifiers. We'll do it again now, and we'll do it one more time later in the course. So whenever we've gotten z, we always arrived at it from x. We did some kind of transformation. And the type of transformations we're going to be talking about this week uh, are going to be linear transformations. So that's the kind of holding on to the linear model type thing. And Z is going to be our transformed features, as always. And W is going to be, W is going to store the transformation itself. And so we are going to be learning W and sort of 
automatically learning the transformation. Okay. Um, I've decided to move the demo super early in this lecture. I don't know. There's, this is a tricky one, but um, let's, let's try this. I just want to try to give you the visual intuition immediately. We'll see if it works. But with, obviously, I haven't really said anything yet. Um, but let's just play around with some code. OK, so I'm going to create a data set. And I'm going to transform this data set from two dimensions to one dimension. So we were often doing the other way around when we were talking about polynomials. We said, we'll start with one feature, and we'll make k features, one for each monomial. Or we'll make n features with RBF features. But here with PCA, the dimension of our transformed features is actually going to be lower than the dimension of what we started with. And it's, for that reason, called dimensionality reduction. So I'm just using scikit-learn PCA here. And I'm saying we want one component. So I want to somehow reduce this data set to one dimension. And then I'm just going to run this thing and visualize it. OK, there's a lot going on here in this plot. But the essence of, of PCA and of all the stuff we're going to be talking about today is that we're going to be projecting our points onto some subspace. I'm using subspace in kind of the linear algebra way of talking. So the blue points are the original points. And the black thing is W. Um, that's the this subspace that I've learned, which is just a line. It's a one-dimensional object. And the red points here are my z values. So I've said, OK, I'm starting in two dimensions. I'm going to learn this line. And then my, uh, my z values are going to be, I have this new coordinate system along the line. I only need one number to say where I am along a line. <coughs> and that's going to be my z. And OK, it, if you're a little bit confused, that's OK. Because as I said, I'm, I moved this extremely early in the lecture before I've really said anything. But let's try another example. Um, so I'll create some three-dimensional data set, which looks like this. OK. Here's some points. And I'm going to run PCA with k equals 2. So I'm going to say, hey, I would like to reduce this thing down to two dimensions. And now I have the same kind of plot with the same color scheme. So the blue points are my original points. And I've learned this subspace, this plane. And this may kind of remind you of linear regression. And I'm going to explain why it's not linear regression. But I'm going to say, hey, I would like all my points to live on this plane, on this k equals 2, right? So I'm I say, I'm going to restrict myself to two dimensions. That means a plane. And if I could only live in two dimensions, how would I want to do that? Well, I'm going to pick this optimal plane. And all of Wednesday, we'll talk about what optimal means. We won't even talk today about how to pick the best one. But then I'll project my points onto that thing. And those are going to be my z values. And so if we turn this kind of sideways, we can sort of see what's happening. Um, the, the blue lines are showing this projection. And maybe actually the way I really want to turn this, if I can, bear with me. I guess I want to turn it like this. Yeah. So looking at it from the top, is kind of another way of thinking about this, which is I have my points in three dimensions, but I'm only, I want to restrict myself to two dimensions. So here we are, look, I've rotated things in a particular way. 
And now these are just my two coordinates. This coordinate and that coordinate. And so my each point used to be represented by three numbers, x, y, z, because it's in three dimensions. But now I'm only allowing myself two numbers per point. And those two numbers represent where I am in this new 2D coordinate system along the plane. And I can even plot the z values with just a regular scatter plot. And it looks like this. So somehow the essence of what we're doing here is we start with a bunch of points in some space of some dimension. And I'd say, I would like to live in a lower dimension. So I'm going to learn this subspace, project onto it. And here are those same points. But now instead of plotting the x's, which would require a three-dimensional plot, I'm plotting the z's, which just requires a two-dimensional plot, because I'm squeezing each point into having to be represented by only two numbers instead of three. Arman. What do the colors on the plane represent? Oh, yeah, the colors on the plane, I spent like at least 10 minutes trying to get rid of the colors, but I couldn't. <laughs> um, it's, it's just automatically coloring by the, the Z coordinate. Yeah, I wanted it to be like a gray, translucent plane. But, but the other colors mean something. So the blue points are the original points, and the red points are projecting those onto the plane. And of course, it keeps doing that annoying thing. Um, OK. So oh, let me do one more thing, and then I'll take questions. OK, so another thing we can do is we can start with the same d equals 3. We could, which data set is in three dimensions. We have three features. But now I'm going to set k equal to 1, which is happening right here. I'm just saying I only want to, I want to get myself down to one dimension instead of two. So here's what this looks like. My subspace is only one dimensional now. It's just a line. When I set k equals one, I said all these points, you have to just live on a line now. You start in three dimensions. I showed you what it looks like if the points have to be projected into two dimensions. And now this is a more extreme case. And so the black thing is the, the learned line. And the blue are the original points. And the red are these z values. So this is all very, very geometrical. Um, but yeah, Christian, um, right? Yeah. Um, if you start with a three-dimensional um, data set and then uh, bring it down to a two-dimensional and then to a one-dimensional, do we get the same line? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, if I start with a three-dimensional data set and then take it down to two dimensions and then down to one, will I get the same? <sighs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it probably wouldn't be that hard to figure it out, but it's not something I've thought of before. Yeah, for today in general, we're not going to say anything about how to pick this line or plane. OK, so I want to show you the actual values here inside the code. So x looks like this. This should not surprise you, right? x is some number of rows by 3, because this is a three-dimensional thing that I've been showing you. And z, uh, z looks like this in this case, because I, z is coming from the case where k equals 1. So what are these z values? For each point that used to be in three dimensions, to draw one of these blue things here, I need three numbers. But to draw one of these red things, I only need one number, just how far along the line is it, starting from the origin. For now, the lines, everything's going to pass through the origin, and we'll sort that out later. But these z values are just saying, these are the red points. They're saying, how far along the line am I? Um, and these things, 
when I actually want to plot the red points using the plotting library that I'm using, I still need to specify what the red points are in three dimensional space because the plotting library doesn't know anything about PCA and distance along the line. So I have to get the coordinates of those red points in the three dimensional coordinate system that my plotting library is using. And that's what this inverse transform thing. It says, here are my points along the line, but if I wanted to talk about them back in the original three dimensional space, what would their coordinates be then? And that's what these numbers are. So they're back in three dimensions, and it's not the same as x, because, well, you just saw it yourself. The blue points and the red points are not in the same places, right? So when I transform an inverse transform, I'm not recovering my points, meaning this is not an invertible operation. And why would it be invertible? If I take three numbers and compress it down to two numbers or one, how would I expect to get the original thing back? I don't. And finally, w is the line itself. So this is kind of the, the slopes, if you will, of the line. Why is there three slopes? Why are there three instead of two, I guess? Um, yeah, we, we will get to that. Okay. Yeah. Cheyenne. So, if I like use PCA to reduce the dimensions of my data set, is there information loss if I train it using the? Is there information loss? Yes, for sure. I mean, how, how could there not be? In, in, unless, OK, if my data set happened to perfectly lie on a line to begin with, then no. But that's kind of like a crazy case, right? So in general, yes, there's information loss. And that's exactly what I'm showing here. Feature selection a better technique in order to? Uh, louder? So isn't feature selection a better technique in order to like reduce the dimensions instead of this? Isn't feature selection a better technique in order to reduce the dimensions? Feature selection is also has information loss. If I throw away feature one, well, now I don't have it anymore. So you're right. Feature selection can reduce you down from d dimensions to some k less than d dimensions. But I can't go back either. I've, now I've thrown, I cannot get from my five features back to my 10 features just by doing something to those five features, right? So, so no. I, not really. I mean, feature selection is one way of reducing your dimension, and it works by just throwing things away. As we'll see, this is another way, and it works by combining the original features, taking linear combinations of the original features. Um, and in terms of the loss, which again, I don't want to talk about until Wednesday, this would actually do a better job, because you can pick kind of arbitrary rotations of things, whereas feature selection is like saying I'm going to do this, but constrain myself to an axis aligned like this plane or that plane, right? Um, because this plane means I'm just throwing away my Z feature and only keeping X and Y, but here I can rotate however I want, so I have more flexibility. Yeah, Fed. Why would you want to do this? Yeah, we'll get to that. Why would you want to do this? Yeah, I, I, I took a bit of a, a risk. Um, starting with the demo. I don't know if it's going to pay off or not. But let's do a couple more questions, and then we'll get to the actual lecture. Edwin. If we plot the original data set, is it still going to look like some uh, projecting on the line or plane? What do you mean by plot the original data set? Uh, instead of the inverse transform, uh, plot the original three uh, data set with three uh, features. So the original data set is the blue stuff. Is it not the inverse transform? The red things are the inverse transform, what I'm calling x hat. The blue things are the points I started with. And then, so there are three, four things you have to keep in mind. And that's why this is so confusing. You have to keep in mind what is x, what is z, what is w, and what is x hat. And they all play a role. x is my original data set. z is I'm expressing my points in this new coordinate system, like how far along the line am I? x hat is I want to take those points that are on the line, but it, express them back in my original coordinate system, which I had to do to plot those red dots. And then w is the representation of the line or plane or whatever itself. OK, one more question, if there is one, before we get back to it. 
Okay, let's go back then. Um, okay, so here's the plan. Today we need to make more concrete the kind of hand wavy stuff we just did. Um, and then next class we'll talk about how do I actually get W, what loss should I use, how do I train it, blah, blah, blah. Okay, turns out this stuff I'm talking about is actually related to k-means, which might come as a surprise. It looked more like linear regression, but mathematically it's kind of like k-means in the following sense. So uh, you guys had that assignment with k-means with vector quantization where you had the picture of something and then you did the colors. You had that. Okay, right. So when you do that assignment, each pixel of your image um, had three numbers. It was a color, red, green, blue. And so you had uh, D was equal to three and, and you had N pixels. And then you tried to find some colors that were like the prototype color. So if I'm only restricting myself to eight colors, what are the best colors? And that was called vector quantization because in that three-dimensional color space, you just found the eight kind of templates or representative examples in a sense, and then you approximated each pixel with one of those eight things or 16 or however many. Um, so that's what this is saying. Replace xi by mean of cluster. That's exactly what you did in that assignment. You said, I'm going to replace this pixel with whatever color it is. I'm going to replace that with wyi. So yi is the cluster that that point was assigned to, which was the closest one, the closest color. I'm just going to replace whatever color it was with wyi, with the closest color of my eight or however many. So it's like any of these red points get approximated by the red circle, any of these green points get approximated by the green square, and so on. So you can think of k-means when used in the vector quantization way <coughs> as a way of approximating points, which is what I was showing you earlier in a sense. I was showing you the red points were kind of approximating the blue points. So Here's how we can think about, mathematically connect these things. Vector quantization says my x is approximately one of my w's. Remember, the w's are storing the means in k-means, right? My x is approximately one of the w's. In other words, a bit verbosely, it is zero of the first one, one of the second one, zero of the third one, zero of the fourth one, etc. Oops. So we could say there was a z vector of 0, 1, 0, 0, and the z vector is telling us how much of each cluster mean. The z vector is just holding those coefficients, OK? 0, 1, 0, 0. So we can think of, oh, right. So then for each point, you have a z vector. So if x was n by d, in k-means vector quantization, z becomes n by k because you have k clusters and you need a coefficient for each cluster. In this case, we had four clusters. <coughs> so PCA, this thing we're doing today, one of many ways of thinking about it is it's like that, but z can be whatever. It doesn't just have to be a 1 and a bunch of zeros. So it's, it's like you're doing vector quantization, but instead of saying each point is assigned to be its closest thing, its closest color or whatever, you just say each point can actually be a linear combination of all my means, but we can't call them means anymore because that's not a valid interpretation, but all my w's. And we happen to call them factors. Any questions or comments? These are kind of two completely different viewpoints I've showed you. The, the one in the notebook and then this. They're all talking about the same thing, but just explained in two completely different ways. Well, it's a bit generous to say explained in the first case, but shown in one way and explained in, in, in this way.
but we'll make that connection by the end of today. Anna. Um, I guess why do we care about Z then? Like where the original points land versus just caring about W? Why do we care about Z? Right. So it depends what you're doing. And for clustering, in fact, um, sometimes you care about W and sometimes you care about Z. So just going back to k-means from a month ago, right? Let's say I just want to know which points are in the same cluster as which other points. In that case, I only care about Z, because Z is telling me which points are assigned to which cluster. And by looking at Z, that thing up there, I can see that the first point and the second point are together, and the third one and the fourth one are together, and the fifth one is different. And I don't actually care what the cluster means are, if that's why I was doing clustering in the first place. On the other hand, let's say I was doing this um, vector quantization thing like you did in the assignment. In that case, you cared about Z and W. You cared about Z because you wanted to know which was the closest template color, but you also need to know what the template color was. But let's say I, I gave this example of a pasta sauce or whatever it was when we talked about clustering the first time. Let's say I invite 100 people and I say I can only sell three types of pasta sauces and um, I get their favorite pasta sauce and pasta sauce space and I, I do clustering and then I just want to find out the three clusters. In that case, I just want to start selling those three pasta sauces. I only care about W because that tells me three good pasta sauces to start selling. And I don't actually care about Z in that case at all because those were just the 100 people I happened to invite for my experiment. I don't even care what they like. I just wanted to get W and then throw away Z and start selling them, right? So it's not that you care about W or you care about Z. Sometimes one, sometimes the other, sometimes both. It's the same thing's going to happen in PCA. So sometimes we're doing PCA in order to get Z. Sometimes we're doing it in order to get W. And we will talk about those applications as we proceed through the week. <coughs> Any other questions? about either the original visualization or this connection to k-means. OK, so we have a lot of notation to talk about, because there's a lot of actors in this play. So we have x and k. Those are the inputs to PCA. And the outputs are z and w. OK, let's look at the dimensions of these things. The dimension of W is k by d. That is good, because that's what it was for k means as well. So instead of storing k means, I'm storing, as we'll see in a few minutes, k basis vectors, basically, or factors. We can, we'll just call them factors. And then z is size n by k. Well, that definitely makes sense. That, to me, makes more sense than the size of w. Why is z n by k? Well, I said I'm trying to get something for each point. So if I start with n points, I better have n new things, right? So z better have n rows, because I need one of these things per point. And why by k? Why do I have k numbers for each point? Well, it's like I was saying. Z is your position along the line, or your position in the plane. So if k equals 1 and you're learning a line, then z is your position along that line. So you just need one number. If k equals 2 and you're learning a plane, z is your position in that two-dimensional coordinate system. So you need two numbers. So however what k is, that's your new dimension. That's how many numbers you need to express a point in that new space, in that subspace. So that's why z is n by k. OK, we've got some notation. Some row stuff, some other row stuff. Yeah, we'll have to be a bit careful. Uh, sometimes we want to talk about the rows of W. Sometimes we want to talk about the columns of W. We'll use um, subscript and superscript notation for that. But if you can understand, rather than memorize, why these matrices have these dimensions, then you're in a pretty good shape. OK, so as I said, there's so many ways of thinking about PCA. One of them is that we're approximating points. We're approximating those blue points with the red points. And well, this is a bit too subscripty for me. 
Um, how about this one? OK. Maybe that's a bit easier for me. Um, we're approximating x as a combination of these w's. So it's still too subscripty. <coughs> that's the one I want. OK. For me personally, this blue thing makes more sense than any of the ones that are written out, which I find confusing. Xi, a particular training example, gets approximated as W transpose times Z. What does that mean? It's a matrix multiplication. So it means it's the, the first. Transposed? Yeah, it should be transposed. Okay, good. So we're taking, um, point is, we're taking this first factor, this first w that's in d dimensional space, and we're multiplying it by some amount, which is the first element of z, plus the second w times the second element of z, and so on and so forth. So all of these different ways of writing the mathematical notation, they're all saying the same thing, which is that x is being represented by a sum of these w's, where you have the first, thing, first z times the first vector plus the second z times the second vector, which is like k means, but with k means, again, that z just had one, one, and the rest zero. So it said, I'm just going to take one of these vectors and not any of the rest. So you may also hear this referred to as matrix factorization. That's because that equation I just wrote for you for one training example, meaning one row of x, we can write it as some big matrix thing for all the rows of x. x is approximated by zw. So that's just a compactified version of what I was showing you before, which is for each row of x, meaning each point, we have a row of that matrix multiplication, which is a row of z giving the weights for all the different w's. OK, so my personal favorite way of thinking about PCA, and I know I'm throwing many different ways of thinking about it at you, um, is this. PCA learns a k-dimensional subspace of the original space. We talked about that. We looked at it. It's a hyperplane or line in one dimension or so on. And from linear algebra, how do I represent a subspace? Well, I need a basis, right? If I have two-dimensional space, I need two basis vectors. If I have a k-dimensional space, I need k basis vectors. Of all the ways to interpret PCA, as I said, my favorite is this. We're trying to learn a subspace, a k-dimensional subspace. That means we need a basis. We need k basis vectors. That's what w is. It is just a storage container for k basis vectors. That's, it's k by d, right? So each basis vector is d-dimensional. So back to the, if we go back to the notebook, This, is, this thing is a plane. A plane is a two-dimensional subspace. We need two basis vectors to represent the plane, one going like this and one going like that. And that's what W is actually storing. And then the representations in the new basis are being stored by Z. So how much of each basis vector do I need to get to every point? So W is fundamentally containing the transformation and z is fundamentally containing our points in the new coordinate system. OK, here's another way of thinking about it. Here's an old video game called Doom. 
and you walk around, <laughs> shoot people. I guess this is a chainsaw in this in this picture, but you you have this map available to you where you can see where you are. And this map is actually only showing you where you are in two dimensions. But that's kind of good enough. And yeah, you can maybe you can jump, right? Or maybe you can even climb on stuff. I don't remember, but you don't really need that third dimension to know where you are because you can't really go, you know, you, there's, you can't climb that high, right? You're basically just walking around and maybe jumping. So even though the guy here is in a three-dimensional world, you only really need two dimensions to do a good job of saying where the person is. So you can view this map as a latent factor model in the following way. Each x, meaning a position of where the, the person is, has three values, the x, y, and z coordinates. The map is only two-dimensional. You saw it, right? It was two-dimensional. And so w is this. The first basis vector is 1, 0, 0, which is you know, that way. The second basis vector is 0, 1, 0, which is that way. I'm just, I, I don't, the span of those two vectors cannot get me off the ground, right? It's just this vector and this vector, and the span is the ground. And so I can only approximate your location by somewhere on the ground, which is what that map was showing you, right? The, speaking of information loss, the map loses the ability to make the distinction between you here and you jumping up here because it chose as its basis this axis aligned two-dimensional plane. And that's, that's what it really looks like. Those are the basis vectors. But you could pick two different basis vectors, have W be a different two by three matrix, and it would be some different plane. Uh, and it depends on your data set. So if your data set in this case is the player's position walking around the game, this makes a lot of sense. Right. And the Zs are exactly the, the, the coordinates on the map. Um, OK, we talked about that. We just ignore the height. OK, we talked about that. Um, but look at this. So this is some goats. And goats can live in very slopey environments without falling down. So here's a zoomed in picture. If I want to say where these goats are, and I just use those same basis vectors from the video game, it's a horrible approximation, right? Because I lose the information to say anything about height, but height is very important here. And actually, these goats are also pretty much wandering around a two-dimensional space, but it's not the same two-dimensional space as the video game guy. That was this two-dimensional space. The goats is this very, very slopey one. In either case, two dimensions are sufficient to get a pretty good representation of where you are. But the W that you would learn is different. And the question is, can we learn that from data, right? So if I'm given the positions of these 20 goats, can I learn automatically the best W? And once I have W, I get the Zs pretty easily. And we have not yet said how to get that. But that's what the overall goal of what we're doing here is. Given a bunch of examples, can I and some hyperparameter k, number of dimensions, can I find a good subspace? And it should be possible, right? And the more data you have, you should be able to kind of tell just by looking at the data, oh, they kind of live on this subspace. Any questions or comments? OK. So I said I would talk about this, least squares versus PCA. So with least squares, we are minimizing the vertical distance squared between our line and our points. 
and we're just trying to predict. So since we only care about doing a good job of predicting, in a sense we only care about this vertical distance, which is how wrong are we from the true y value. So with PCA, and we'll, we haven't yet talked about the loss function, we'll talk about it on Wednesday, but you're, you actually care more about the orthogonal distance. Um, when you look at this picture, you might think these two things are very similar. And a very important goal by the end of today's class is to see that they're different. So I think this is a relatively important slide. So least squares is learning a d-dimensional hyperplane. When we draw the thing, we usually think about it in d plus 1 dimensional space, because we have our d features and our target, our y. That's this extra dimension. For example, if I want to draw a picture, and I have one feature, and I'm doing a regression, I can draw a picture on a two-dimensional projector screen. And if I have 10 features, and I wanted to think about it, it's kind of an 11-dimensional thing, like my, t my x, y pairs would then be 11 dimensional. And the point of least squares is that I want to input d numbers and output one number, which is supervised learning, right? So with PCA, that picture I was showing you on the previous slide, it's true. It looked kind of like least squares, but I do not need to pick k equal to, how do I? not mix this up, um, d minus 1, which is what I was showing on the previous slide. I can do any number of dimensions as long as k is, has to be greater than 0. Otherwise, it makes no sense. What does it mean if k is 0? I'm learning nothing, right? And if k is d, well, why can't k be equal to d? k can't be equal to d because if I'm in a d-dimensional space and I want to learn a d-dimensional subspace, meaning I'm allowing myself d basis vectors, well, I can just pick a basis that spans the entire space. And then I can perfectly reconstruct all the points. I'll just pick w to be the identity matrix, z equals x, and I have this pointless, right? I haven't actually done anything. Because remember, if k equals d, then z would be n by d, which is the same size as x. I can just set z equals x, w would be d by d. I can just set it to be the identity matrix. x equals itself times the identity matrix. That's not interesting, right? But the intuition there is I'm trying to learn a subspace. And so I need to restrict myself to have not enough basis vectors to actually span the whole d-dimensional space. And then I'll learn something interesting. So we saw in the notebook the case where, k equal, where d equals 3, we saw both k equals 2 and k equals 1. We saw the plane and we saw the line, and those are both kind of interesting cases. And we didn't look at k equals 3 or 0, because those are not interesting. And in general, k can be any value. So yes, both of these things are somehow linear, and both of these things somehow involve hyperplanes, but they are far from the same thing. Another way of saying it is in supervised learning, one of the dimensions is special. It's the target, and the rest are the features. Here, none of the dimensions are special. I just have d dimensions, and I'm doing stuff with them, but it's, none of them is particularly the dimension. OK. Um, so Fed asked why we would ever do this. Um, there's a bunch of reasons. One reason is we could do this as a pre-processing step to supervise learning. So we talked about. Well, change of basis. Should we use this degree, polynomial, that degree, RBF, kernel, whatever? Well, if this thing is somehow, sp or we talk about feature selection, right? So we can think of this as another way of learning features. And I haven't really done much yet to convince you that these would be good features. But the best I can say for the moment is 
they kind of contain most of the information that the original thing contained because we're trying to pick our subspace intelligently like we saw at the beginning. You know, if my points with the, the goat case, right, I'm going to pick my plane intelligently so I'm not actually losing that much information. That's the optimization that we still need to talk about. But somehow we're squeezing the data and into fewer features which should help maybe get rid of overfitting or learn good features or something like that. Uh, outlier detection. So you'll explore that on your assignment five. Um, but you can say which points were reconstructed well, meaning the red, the blue points and the corresponding red points, were they really far away from each other in any case? And if so, it's like saying the whole data set conforms to living in the subspace except for that one point that's really far away. Maybe that's an outlier. Dimension reduction. So, well, that's essentially what we're doing, and these are all different reasons why you might want to do it. Um, you can think of it as doing compression. It's not, the problem is like true data compression involves discrete entities, like bits. You have something, it takes this many bits, you need to compress it into that many bits. And here we're dealing with real numbers, so it's a bit complicated to talk about compression. Um, but it is related to compression because we're squeezing more numbers into fewer numbers and trying to not lose information. Visualization. So I talked at the very beginning of the course, like second lecture maybe, about what do you do when you're starting playing with a data set. Maybe you want to visualize it, but how do I visualize it if it's 100 dimensions? And now we're getting to the part of the course where we talk about how to do that. So going back to the notebook for a second. The data here is 3D, but I can make this visualization by just looking at the Zs. And even if D was 1,000, I could set K equals 2, run PCA, and I could get a picture like this. And it's a bit hard to interpret, but maybe I see a bunch of points over here and a bunch of points over there, and I say, oh, that's interesting. There seems to be two groups of points, which we can't really just look at that in 100 dimensions. And finally, sometimes you might want to actually interpret what are those dimensions. So I showed you that scatter plot in 2D, but sometimes we can actually understand, oh, this direction is some meaningful quantity, and that direction is some meaningful quantity. Um, and can I start to understand my, my space um, or interpret? Interpret the directions along which my data varies. Uh, yeah, I kind of suspected we wouldn't have time for this, so that's fine. I will just talk about this next time. Next time. OK. Uh, we talked about this already. But it's worth noting that that's not true for k means. So with k means, there's no reason why k needs to be less than d. You can just make k whatever. You can have two dimensions and five clusters. That's totally fine. Uh, but PCA for PCA, that's not fine. It's not the same thing as k means. OK. So I will get to that other stuff next class. That's fine. I'm not, not surprised that we didn't have time. So this general thing we talked about today, they're called latent factor models. The, the, the latent factors are these Ws that we're trying to learn. They're latent. They're unobserved. But we're trying to get them just in an unsupervised way, just by looking at the data set. What are the different directions of variation? And the z's are kind of, for each point, you get a z vector of length k, which is, serves as coefficients for the w vectors. And PCA is a specific case of a latent vector model. Uh, and I haven't been too careful about drawing the line between what is specific to PCA and what's not. 
but that's okay. Um, we haven't yet fully specified PCA either because I still need to say what is the loss and I still need to say all that stuff that I just skipped and then we can say what PCA is specifically out of the general class of latent factor models. So that's it for today. See you on Wednesday.